Welcome back to another hour of Sky Shower. I am Noah. And I'm Jesse. All right, this evening we have episode 116. I think it will be a great uh, episode. Uh, this evening we are going to review Old Pul- Pulteney uh, Hudart. Or Hudart. I don't know. I probably butchered that. Hudart. Hudart. <laughs> From there, we'll have our get-togethers uh, or and shout-outs, and then we'll be adding a new travel notes section here. Uh, and then from there, we have a restaurant review, which is Marco's Coal Fire Pizza, followed by our Smarter Challenge being the review. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, I've not seen it yet, uh, but it'll be a, a review of the Fast 10. All right. Um uh, Thank you for all of you who uh, watch us on YouTube and Rumble. Thank you to our newest uh, uh, subscriber. We just reached 80. Our whole goal is to reach 1,000. So uh, if, please help us uh, get the word out. And uh, please like, share, subscribe uh, to our podcast. Uh, since we are trying to get to 1,000, even if you only listen to us once, uh, hit that subscribe button and uh, you know what? you don't even have to listen to us ever again if you don't like us, but hopefully you do uh, and help us reach that goal of 1,000 uh, viewers there uh, or subscribers on YouTube so we can open up some other features uh, to make this a better podcast for you. And uh, also, if you have any comments, if you have any suggestions about topics that you want to hear, hear us talk about during our uh, smart challenge section or uh, any scotches you you would like us to review, uh, please leave that there or any other kind of suggestions. Uh, we will uh, look at them and and most of the time we implement them. Almost like ninety, almost a hundred. You say a hundred percent of the time, or almost like ninety five percent of the time. I mean, eh, what the hell, hundred percent of the time? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, hundred percent of the time. <laughs> I, I, I do think like every suggestion we've gotten, we've done so. So please give us some more feedback. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. Or you can put your own reviews in. A couple of people, have, uh, a couple of listeners have put uh, their own reviews of, of the scotch uh, that they've done themselves. And we love hearing that and reading that stuff. Scotch All right. The old Pulteney hood art. Fine oak matured single malt scotch whiskey. Uh, the Old Pulteney Distillery, founded in 1826 by James Henderson. And man, you know, it's one of the, and it has always been one of the most northerly distilleries in the mainland of Scotland. Because of that, way back in 1826, one of the problems was a lack of roads to get things like barley to the distillery. So a lot of their deliveries and shipments back then were done by sea. Um, with that, man, you know, something that really hits is... Uh, when you get into a situation like prohibition in, uh, man, 25 years of prohibition, that's something pretty significant to survive. But you get into that situation um, and for 25 years, can't sell everything in Scotland is locked down. Um, finally, prohibition ends 1947 and they are open to business once again they uh, start producing single malt scotches and uh, then in the 90s it was sold to its present owners in 95 to inver house distillers um, and that was actually in 97 the new iconic old pulteney 12 year old was released beginning a new era of old pulteney uh, since then they've got a few different releases like this hood art and it's going to be I do believe very interesting. So it is matured in hand selected fine oak ex bourbon casks and then finished in ex peated malt casks. Um, so it itself is not a peated Scotch whiskey. However, it was finished in casks that were previously peated to give it a slight peat hint while remaining sweet and very flavorful. Uh, most likely going to be a pretty creamy Scotch. Got something? Tours? Fun? Uh, tours. <laughs> okay. So with the tours. So right now they're currently open April from uh, from April to September. They're currently open Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 
Also, 5 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when Thank businesses you. do that. Right. Open Sunday, 10 to 10. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 10. Open Saturday, 10 to 10. <laughs> <laughs> How are they not open on Sunday? Uh, but then when they do switch over, they do switch their hours over in October to March, and that's Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Uh, there is no Saturday hours. <laughs> All right. No Saturday. All right. So here uh, they have three different types of experiences that you can book with them. The first one is called the uh, the Spirit of Wick. Uh, it's a perfect tour as an introduction to old uh, Pulteney. Uh, they follow a journey of a single malt, learning the various processes from milling to maturation and how the coastal location and maritime uh, or the maritime like climate uh, marine climate influences the character of the whiskey. Uh, and there you get to try a dram of both the, the, the 12 year and the hoodart, hoodart, uh, before receiving a complimentary, uh, Glen carrying glass to take home. So, uh, that's only, that's approximately $19 USD. It's pretty cheap. Uh, and I, I, this is current. So this is as of today, uh, it's nineteen dollars USD, so with that exchange rate, and it's uh, fifteen quid or uh, Great British pounds. The next step up here is called from the source. And this is for those who are looking for an in-depth experience, and here you'll be led uh, by their experience guide, discovering the journey of a single malt uh, from their water source to glass, and they'll be then you'll be invited to the whiskey tasting room where you'll explore their core range of single malt whiskeys from the famous 12 year old to the warming of the 18 year old. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> but if you want the ultimate, Oh wait, before I get to the ultimate, oh, it, that one is approximately 49 USD and or 40, uh, great British pounds, 40 quid. Now, if you want the ultimate experience, this is called the fleet experience. And this is where their experience guide will give you a full insight into the production process following the journey of the single malt at the warehouse. The experts will uh, help you navigate through the whiskey tasting adventure of the full collection of single malt whiskeys, including their 25 year old and two exclusive hand bottlings. So uh, this one here is uh, one, approximately $124 or approximately 100 quid. And I think that's probably the way to go. I mean, if you can do it, you might as well go all out, right? Hell yeah. Why not? And it would be interesting too, because one of the things about the distillery is in 1951, it underwent major renovations. And we've talked about some of the other Scotch distilleries where they still do traditional floor maltings. Um, but however, in 1951, when they did the renovations at Old Pulteney Distillery um, in Wick, of course, they decommissioned and they stopped doing the traditional floor malting. So it would be interesting to see how that uh, area that is now the visitor center was transformed and how they process that malting step now. It would be a lot of fun to enjoy that. With this 46% uh, ABV, one of the things I really enjoy, and they like to consider themselves the maritime malt, so high on the northern end of the mainland, uh, as you mentioned, closer to the sea, that brine flavor, uh, it's going to be a great dram if it has half the brine I'm looking for. All right. So as we proceed with the old Pulteney box, magnetic top, kind of fancy, sticks on there a little bit, square, the bottle. It's going along with more of that common theme now where it looks like it's more hand specified, but it's not still all printed out. The bottle is interesting. I'm not saying it's sexy. <laughs> Rib for her pleasure. <laughs> That's literally what kind of plug is that, you know? <laughs> Uh, I do love the colors of the box, kind of that maritime sea green. Uh, the bottle itself, though, I'm not dying for. Is that a sea green? Because it looks great. It's you know, I thought it looked great, too, until I, like, really compared it to a gray. It's got a little bit of a sea green in it. 
Uh, but yeah, it's it's just a little. It's a hint. All right, not well, a lot. <laughs> to my eyesight, it pretty much looks uh, gray, gold, and white. <laughs> it's, a- it, it's just a hint to see green. Just a hint. Well, while you're opening that, I guess I'll say something else here real quick. Yeah. Then, uh, this is actually named off uh, named after the street on which the, the distillery resides on. I'm not sure if you actually said that or not. Did not. Okay, so there you go. Now we know that uh, the way they came up with this name of this is uh, that's the street the distillery is located on. That's right. Not so sexy. <laughs> <laughs> but not bad. It's cool. Oh, they're in uh, Wick, Scotland. Yeah, uh, plastic top. At least it has a little definition. Real cork. I like that. One nice thing about the bottle gives you that great pour sound. All right. Well, I guess it is time for our uh, speed. Or I don't know what do I call it anymore. Turbo section, speed section, warp speed, warp and speed tasting. Tasting. <laughs> I just, I, I just not with you tonight. Cheers. We're on vacation mode. It's cool. <laughs> Cheers. All right, old uh, Pultony. Pultony, I don't know. Uh, this uh, this particular expression from them, the the hood art, uh, I find it very interesting. The uh, the nose. Well, before you start with the nose, let's, let's we'll start with the coloring. Here. <laughs> <laughs> the coloring I have is a like a light or medium to light or light to medium gold in that kind of range, and I do like the color of it. Um, and I put it down as a, uh, four out of five. Um, so I do like the coloring, the packaging. I, I don't know, man, <laughs> from afar, it definitely looks like a dark shade of gray <laughs> up close. I get, I can kind of see your, your like has hints of sea green in it. I wouldn't exactly call it sea green, but I'm not exactly calling it gray anymore. Uh, maybe somewhere in between the two, but it's, uh, but the package itself, the box, I, I do like how they have like the how it kind of like separates between like the main part of the box and the topper that you pull off. Um, and honestly, what is that? Great. That's gray on your phone. <laughs> I mean, it kind of looks. Yeah, gray I to agree. Me. Like it's gray, but it's got a hint of sea green. <laughs> Made by the sea, the uh, maritime whiskey. All right, so I kind of lost where I was going, but the gray box. Oh, yeah. Well, anyways, I gave that a four out of five, whatever color that is. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and the, so going into the actual scotch itself, um, here I got like caramel and vanilla with some brine and hints of apple. Um, and it was a nice uh, kind of a... Had like a nice little bit of sweetness to it with a little bit of saltiness and it almost kind of reminds you of like uh like maybe some like uh, salted caramel apples you might get like during a nice cold october uh during like some of those halloween festivals or something like that um that's what it kind of like it reminded me of but maybe not quite as sweet as that but you definitely get that those hints of vanilla and the caramel and the apple and then and, and that brine in there uh with the aroma um, I gave it a 26 out of 30. I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, and it, it made me want to try this particular expression. So as I, uh, try that here, um, I, uh, tasted like burnt sugar with some vanilla and honey that kind of leads into like a, uh, to some like bananas, but, and that's kind of like mostly like, uh, all kind of like. It's like it's not like super sweet. I mean, like me saying that makes it sound like it's super sweet, but it's not like offensively sweet or anything. But it has like just a nice sweetness where you kind of get like that burnt sugar and you kind of get hints of the vanilla, and you do get uh, 
uh, the hints of the banana in there, but then uh, along with some honey, mm -hmm. but then like in front of like that back of the mid palate to the start of the finish, uh, you start getting like these nice grassy uh, undertones, which I believe comes from like some thyme. Uh, and then the finish here, uh, oh, well, I didn't give you my points for the palate. I gave that 26 out of 30 because I did like the complexity of it. Um, it was enjoyable to me. And then uh, going into the finish, here, this is where I put, I got leather with smoked peat uh, with a nice lingering uh, spice and honey sweetness. And that really, that lingering spice and honey sweetness really kind of makes for a nice flavorful finish for me. I really couldn't pinpoint what the spice was, um, but I did enjoy it. It wasn't like overly powerful spice where like some of the past uh scotches that we've had i've definitely did not like that spice uh this one was a uh, it was a nice spice so i tend to think and this is just a shot in the dark and i think i mentioned it to you i thought it might be ginger but i could totally be way off base on that um but there is that like i said a nice lingering spice with some uh with some honey and sweetness that goes along with it that i did enjoy and being like I'm more of a wine drinker, the one part I did like about that finish is getting those earthy tones, mainly the leather type of uh, flavor you get. Uh, so I really did enjoy that. So I gave out a 26 as well. So I do believe that gives me a grand total of 86 points. It does. Uh, when I take it to a black tie pair, I like it, but I don't think I would. Um, when I take it to a poker game, yes. What I put it on my shelf, yes. Uh, would I share with, uh, you know, like a good friend? Yeah, definitely would. Um, and this is where it's kind of tough. Even though I gave it an 86, there's other 86s that, that I've given out that I would rather drink first before this one. Uh, so it could be maybe like a low 86, I guess, uh, on my 86 scale there. But um, it's good. I mean, it's just slightly bit different uh, than some of the other ones that we've had of, as of recent, and maybe that's uh, maybe that plays against it a little bit. So I'm not quite sure because we've uh, had we've had a run of like some really nice scotches. So, uh, but yeah, I like I said, I do like it. And I do enjoy it. I agree with you. I think it is a really flavorful single malt scotch so for me presentation i'm right there with you it's a four don't like the bottle looks like a weird sex object uh the box i'm assuming for me it's maritime green like a, a sea green because they consider themselves the maritime malt um so that maritime scotch so it just kind of made sense to me that they were going for that sea green the color I've gotten to this point where this medium color has become the less sensual to me. I'd rather have it pale or I'd rather have it sun kissed. So I'm right there with you. I also gave it a four for the color. There's nothing wrong with the color. It's a good color. It's just not sensual to me. It's not sexy. The nose. Oh, for me, the nose is, is pretty damn good. There's caramel, creamy vanilla. Um, uh, the slightest hint of apple, and for me, it's red, delicious apple. It's not a green apple, not even close. Might even be Fuji. It's kind of like that crisp, fresh, but not the green. I was actually thinking it was Fuji myself. Okay, too. so yeah, I was like, <laughs> like it definitely isn't Granny Smith or anything like that. No, no, but yeah. So if you're saying Fuji as well, that's what I'm thinking. It's that that little hint, and that's what um, transitions to me on the nose um, to the sea air. And that makes it like crisp and refreshing. It is this wonderful nose. Um, but for me, the, this wonderful nose was still right around a 26. There was nothing that was like a powerhouse, right? Um, the palette, this was actually the win for me. The palette was the win. Burnt sugar immediately followed by honey and uh, uh, like caramelized again not a strong banana flavor like you've like fried the hell out of this banana caramelized banana so you, you're really getting burnt sugar honey i had it and i had a burnt sugar scratched out 
No, I didn't know how to describe it. That, like, literally, that's what it is. It's like when sugar is so burnt that you know what it is, and it's not offensive, but all of a sudden, it's it's not the same. But that burnt sugar, honey, caramelized bananas, um, and it's, you know, when, you, when I'm considering the palate, it's that first half of the flavor. And then, so for me, the palate was a strong 27. I loved all of those flavors mingling together because with that, the hints of smoke and it's not peated, but the hint of peat comes out in that burnt sugar, burnt sugar and honey and fried or caramelized bananas. Um, and then it transitions to the finish and the finish wasn't offensive at all. But it was my least favorite part of it. And when I say the finish, it's really the first two thirds of the finish because that finish transitioned from honey. And I did like this piece, the earthy, the, um, it was kind of like, you know, as a kid, if you didn't suck on a river rock, there's actually something wrong with you, that river rock earthy, and then a mild oak and smoke and leather. But there's heat in there that I cannot place. And it's not cinnamon. It's definitely not cinnamon. Um, I also don't know if it's ginger, but it doesn't have the ginger heat to it unless they did something where that's one of those pieces where they like burnt the hell out of the ginger in some sugar or honey and they fried out the, the ginger flavor, but left the heat. Um, so for me, the finish got a 25 after the palettes, 27, also an 86 for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> got to the same endpoint, but different routes. Would I take it to a black tie affair? I wouldn't not take it, but it would not be in the top 10 I would take. So ultimately what that really means is no, I'm not seeking to take this to a black tie affair. Is it fun to drink? It actually is interesting because it is so different. Old Pulteney, you guys did a nice job here with, as Noah mentioned, your distillery, the Hudart, um, named after the street that your distillery is on there in Pulteney Town, uh, Wick. Scotland and uh you did a really it's a fun scotch so because I absolutely would share with friends like do a flight do a dram take it to a poker night sure I just not love in the bottle like literally the bottle is a turn off I don't know there are people apparently this is a turn on to I am not one of them um but uh as far as the flavor it's fun it is it's always fun to try new scotches and I don't I can say truthfully I have not tried anything like this uh, with the same heat in the mid to uh, finish range that I still can't place if it's some like weird like mask I don't know like uh what's that Tom Cruise movie eyes wide shut eyes wide <laughs> shut type of like party I can see this bottle being there. <laughs> Yeah, I'd be shutting my eyes too. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a bottle that you take to some like weird masquerade. S and M. Yeah, sex party thing. Um, yeah. going with your, your anal plug type of you thing. Yeah, I mean, it would totally <laughs> kind of looks it. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> C seventeen right here. <laughs> Not quite. We didn't do anything wrong. We just said some stuff talked about it. yeah it's like sex ed yeah don't do it <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> it burn stay abstinent yes this will definitely burn there is heat in here <laughs> <laughs> it's time for our shout outs my only get it together go there is to anyone who was surprised that meta got slapped with a billion dollar plus fine by the european union for violating privacy laws I, if anyone's surprised that's when you need to get it together social media absolutely is uh using your talents to make money and giving you the potential to use your talents to make money for you, but they are also absolutely gathering information as has been seen by the European Union all about 
Meta. And right behind them, you've got states outlawing TikTok and then TikTok trying to uh, sue the states. Like, it is what it is, but don't be surprised. Um, here's a really backward shout out. I'm actually going to give them a shout out for not wasting their time going to Imola this past weekend in Formula One because the track was rained out. Would have been too dangerous to race had they even tried. Would have been a terrible experience for the fans. Hopefully, they are able to reschedule it. It's a great track. I love that track. Um, not everyone loves that track. Probably, you know, it's hard to drive. But with that, um, I actually, that's, that's a good shout out because for me, my perception is they did it um, really for the experience of the fans that had spent thousands of dollars on tickets and also the safety of the drivers. And I think I believe in both of those. Uh, so this week, as I mentioned, I'm not going to have a uh, shout out and get get it together. I'm going to use my time to uh, do some travel notes. Um, I did get the uh, Frontier uh, Wild or Go Wild Pass that they have. It's a summer pass. goes from uh, basically went from like the latter part of May into uh, I think September 30th is the last date. Um, I've already went to Florida on this pass. This past weekend, I went to, I flew to Phoenix. And here's what I got to say so far, just going from airport to airport. One, I never like, uh, I guess I never really experienced this before. And you and I were talking about this at dinner, but, uh, something like the, uh, longer stay parking lots, uh, at, uh, Denver international airport, DIA, uh, they were all filled up, like completely filled up. And so I ended up having to stay at the, uh, at the economy parking lot there, right at DIA, which was just actually, uh, maybe like $10 more a day, but, um, it really wasn't that bad of an experience having my car there it's just uh, it took me an hour to find a place to park because i was looking at one of those other more economical choices but later to find out on my flight back from phoenix is that some of these places uh, a lot of cars have been broken into and robbed so uh or stolen so it is kind of good to note that like uh the the two well the one of them is called pike's peak uh, where a person's vehicle was uh stolen out of and I forget the the name of the other lot that was, uh, but it was like right next to a hotel there at DIA. Now, as far as uh, the Phoenix airport, I really enjoyed the Phoenix airport. Uh, you know, I, I did fly into uh, on on Frontier, but the uh, terminal that the, that Frontier is in, it was never overwhelmed or overpacked with a bunch of people. Uh, there was like it was, it almost seemed like there was like. Not a whole bunch of people flying or for whatever crazy reason, but uh, for being a major uh, international airport, uh, Sky Harbor, it actually like it. They, I think they handled the traffic inside the terminal really well. They had some really nice like uh, shopping uh, uh, little stores in there uh, with some great like uh, like the microbrewery place and some other great restaurants in there. The one the one area I do think they need to kind of fix, or it's a little bit. Uh, kind of a crazy situation is the pickup drop-off area and the terminals are kind of like pretty far separated from each other there in phoenix but the actual like i said inside the terminals i really enjoyed outside the terminal not so much um while i'm phoenix though um i had some uh more grand grandiose type plans of going to do a lot of stuff but i ended up getting really caught at one place which is uh queen's creek olive mill and the olive mill there at queen's creek uh the they have this really fun course. It's called Olive Oil 101, uh, and they kind of go through like uh, like uh, how their uh, how they actually became there uh, and built an olive, uh, I guess, uh, olive orchard. I don't know. I'm not sure what they're yeah. called. But yeah, so they, you know, how like uh, the person who built that up there and uh, it is a really interesting class. It takes about 45 minutes and you get a slight tour. And when you go into the main, uh, into the main building there at the olive mill, they have all these different types of uh, infused olive oils uh, with uh, different things, you know, you know, to try them with and different types of vinaigrettes. And it was, uh, it was actually a lot of like a really cool place and a lot of fun. And uh, there was just one lady there. Uh, her name is Monique. She became like my personal, like, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like uh, attendee or, or, or I don't know what, what you might call it. But she, she was like, she was always like, always like spot on to help me. If I had any questions, she's like right there. Or like uh, when, 
I purchased the uh, the tour or the slash class here that, that you know we're talking about here. Uh, she uh, she's the one who helped me out with those tickets as well. Uh, then Wolfgang is the guy who actually did the did the class. He did a phenomenal job. He had us try different types of uh, of olive oils to kind of explain the difference between like uh, extra virgin versus just virgin versus uh, the other stuff that you do not want at all. And uh, it was a really, like I said, it was a really great experience. And then after that, we had some lunch there. Uh, I had the uh, Caprese sandwich, uh, which was great. They had like all their, uh, all the vegetables on there came from their garden that they have there. So it was like these like really great uh, green tomatoes on there with like uh, great balsamic. Uh, and uh, the, obviously the olive oil was, uh, was top notch and the mozzarella was fresh mozzarella. So it was so good. Uh, with uh, truffle fr- uh, fries. Oh, it was great. Truffle fries. And uh, while we were there at lunchtime, they were also, uh, there. they also had music playing there. They had some uh, bocce ball courts. So it was like, uh, it was like, it was a really great afternoon. And we, and we kind of got stuck there a little bit longer than, uh, than anticipated. But I think it really made for a great Saturday uh, experience. Then I went to this place called uh, Saturday night. We went to this place called Nando's uh, Mexican Restaurant. As my friend likes to call it, it's a white people Mexican restaurant. Is <laughs> <laughs> that like a Tex Mex? Uh, that's what I asked her. And she's like, no, no. She's like, this white person. Yeah. She's like, if you go there, you don't really see any like, like uh, Mexicans or Hispanics there. It's always like all a bunch of white people. And she wasn't wrong. <laughs> Might it have been the neighborhood? It could have been the neighborhood. I don't know. But I mean, the food wasn't bad. I did have a little bit of issue with like uh, with uh i forget the name of the dish i i got i did get a dish that the uh waiter had recommended and as you know i'm kind of picky with my cheeses should be and uh it looks like whatever cheddar cheese or whatever they use almost looked like it was like american cheese that was mm. melted on top and it just looked like a melted like rubber uh plastic. square <laughs> yeah and i had to like i had to take that off government like, cheese for yeah. you government <laughs> cheese for so you so after i peeled that off like the actual meal itself was good uh it was uh it, it did have like like shredded chicken in there and some kind of like uh jalapeno cream cheese i think on it uh and it's supposed to be like melted cheddar so maybe maybe I'm wrong with the type of cheddar that they use or what kind of like the yellow cheese that they use there, but that one kind of freaks me out. Uh, then we went to this other place uh, on Friday night when I first arrived there. I, I kind of skipped this one but it, because I went right to the olive mill. But Friday night we went to this place called the uh, Republica Empanada restaurant, and that place is pretty bomb. It was it was great. Like uh, all they do is they sell all these different types of empanadas, and they had this like artichoke heart uh, and uh, mushroom and something else in there. That was probably the best empanada I had. That's like a special empanada, so that was on the regular menu. And uh, I had this other one, which was like the jalapeno popper uh, empanada, which was like cream cheese, potato, and jalapenos. Uh, I think that one would have been. I probably would have liked that one as my favorite, but I think the problem where they went wrong here on this one is they put too much cream cheese in it. Uh, so I think they need to balance that one out with a little bit more uh, potato, a little bit more jalapeno, and I think that one would have been great. Damn, Whitey's ruining the neighborhood. No, this, this, I, no, there's like no Whitey's at this one. <laughs> Except for my friend. She was, she was white. <laughs> Oh, uh, man. And her boyfriend didn't, her boyfriend didn't join us on that one, but he was there at the uh, at the olive mill. And then uh, also after the olive mill, sorry, I'm jumping back to another sat another I mean, Saturday event. We went to this place called the Pork Shop. Nice. The Pork Shop it's just is like this little like hole in the wall place, and they have like all kinds of crazy like like pork chops and bacon, like all pork products. That's awesome. And and when you go in there, they even had like. Uh, as tasters, they had like like four or five crock pots set up of tasting different types of like pork sausages. Mm. One was like a green, uh, like a hatch green chili pork sausage. One was uh, oh. uh, I forget uh, like a brown sugar or maple something pork sausage. It, like they were all phenomenal. And uh, one was called cheeseburger sausage. That's what it was. 
but yeah, that that place was actually pretty cool, I and mean, uh, you could actually go in there and you, and you can actually order or get a, a sandwich there. But that's also in Queens Creek, just uh, probably about a mile or probably I think it's like three miles away from uh, from the Olive Mill. So if you if you don't fill up and have a great time there at the Olive Mill, you could go there to the pork shop and have a, get some like great uh, bacon and stuff like that, or uh, some sandwiches there. Now, where is Queens Creek? Is that north south west east? it's like east of mesa so you have phoenix which is more on the west yep, side yep, yep, yep. Northwest. And then, yeah and then you got mesa and then you got queens creek about another like 20 miles away to the east okay but it's still pretty close like size of arizona it's closer the to the middle than it is the east border of like uh, the phoenix greater phoenix area yeah. i think it's like more on the like the east border okay so my my trips to phoenix have been to things like the uh giant crater the meteor crater there okay and so i don't think i was anywhere near that but man i want to go back to the crater and you make i'm salivating so they sound i'm telling you i'm telling you it, <laughs> honestly if you plan on going back there uh and you think you want to go hit a dollar mill You'll probably spend like a good like three, four, or five hours there, so that, that. that might eat up a little bit too much time. That's all right. Or just plan to make sure you have enough time to like sit there and chill. Because I honestly could have sat there the whole day and like, and if I could have found someone to play bocce ball with, I would have played bocce ball there too and just you know had some like uh, wine or some beer and play bocce ball because that would have been a blast. Scotch hour, bring some paraphernalia to sell. Yeah, exactly. I mean memorabilia. I mean. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and then we went to like a nice breakfast joint, but I forget the name of that place. So uh, maybe I'll bring that up on the next uh, the next podcast if I can uh, find the name of that. Overall, though, I think the I never been to Phoenix. I do plan to go there again. Um, the next time I go there, though, I kind of have more of a a set plan that I want to do because uh, everything else I want to do is like more like museums. Like I want to hit up their uh, natural history museum. I want to hit up their art museum. So the and then their botanical gardens. So these are things I think I can do like in short order type of thing. Like you know, go check stuff out and spend maybe like a couple hours instead of being caught up there for like five six hours like I did with the olive mill. Yeah. Now the empanadas. One last question. Yes. Is good or better than the ones at the fort? Ooh. <laughs> Because those damn Fort Empanadas were the bomb to me, but I haven't had the ones you have. So the <laughs> four ones were bomb, and I think it depends on which empanadas you buy at this place, and I think they could almost rival. Ooh, them. that's hot stuff, then. That's 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 saying a lot. Yes, uh, and and really, and they have, like, these dessert empanada ones, too. They're, uh, I'm, I'm saying, like, you got the it. Republica Empanada place is definitely worth a visit, uh, but I bet it can get pretty pricey because each empanada is about like five fifty, and yeah, they're, and they're and they're kind of small. So like, <laughs> if you go in there like and you're hungry, you can see yourself spending like a good like maybe fifty bucks. <laughs> yeah, wow. I say you know you could probably be you could feel pretty decent off of like two to three of them but i think if you're hungry hungry you're probably gonna get like four or five of them and then you know that's, that's gonna kind of jump up the cost on the empanadas but do they have a nice beer or wine list they do have a nice drink list there. okay excellent and i'm in i'm in all right <laughs> well if we have republica we both, empanada yeah if we both uh end up heading down to phoenix one time we, we'll have to hit up republica empanada and a shout out to you uh Frontier for doing the summer pass for four ninety nine. This week's restaurant, Marcos Coal Fired Pizza. In more than one location, we did visit the one in Centennial by a uh, Dry Creek and I twenty five, just east of that. <laughs> There you're afraid at the Shane Company, which is no longer in existence. I didn't think it was in that way. He's all carrying know. the Shane Company bag. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> Am I back in time? Or is she using a bag from 10 years ago to bring her lunch to work? <laughs> uh, who knows? You never do know. 
All right, so with Marco's coal-fired pizza, it is in a little metro area where there are, uh, I, I would assume, what they would consider luxury apartment homes. Now, in New York, they would definitely not consider these luxury apartments, but luxury apartment homes um, above a set of shops and restaurants, one of which is, of course, of course is Marco's coal-fired pizza. And when you walk in... Uh, it's a simple little place. Uh, I found it very refreshing from a standpoint of it was perfect for a lunch. It was a good weather day. They have a small patio area with a one slanted table that we managed to sit at. <laughs> uh, the, the, but the, overall, the environment was 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 fun for a friends or an easygoing day. It's nothing fancy, nothing sexy, but still on that flirtatious side of fun. Uh, we started with the spinach and artichoke dip, which I thought was really good. It had some great fl flavor, no complaints, no arguments then. I then proceeded along with my draft beer to enjoy the Cecilia. So they have a, 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 a plethora of little personal pizzas now the price um, they've got some great deals the average pizza is between 15 and 25 dollars if you go uh medium to fancy with the cecilia it has prosciutto calls ham artichokes it has san mazzano tomato sauce fritz mozzarella ricotta fresh basil and extra virgin olive oil and some really wonderful uh, mushrooms uh, for me, my pizza was great. However, I will say when Noah gets to his, his rivaled it at a fraction of the price. The service was good. It was actually really good service. Again, it was a great place to visit on a nice weather day for lunch. And we did not go during the peak of lunch. I will point that out. Uh, but, but the service was great. The food to me was outstanding. This is that middle of the range restaurant where it's not fast food. And it's also not, uh, you're not wearing a jacket and, or tie. Would I go there with friends any day of the week? I actually went with my son. It was so much fun going with Noah. Uh, would I go there? Would I take a date there? Absolutely. Uh, if I'm in the area. Now, that brings up the next question. Is it a destination? This is where it gets tricky. I don't know that for the experience and the opportunity that in that area, I can get a better pizza flavor, quantity, quality, and service. So for me, ultimately, if I'm within a 10 mile radius, that is my pizza destination. Now, if I'm going 10 miles or more, it loses that status. But if I'm in that general Denver tech center business area, this is a destination. It will take you a few minutes. I think it took them about 10 minutes to uh, cook the pizzas once we put in the order for that, which was about 10 minutes on top of the spinach and artichoke dip. We were easily there after eating 30, 40 minutes plus. So it is not a fast place for lunch, but it is a fun place. Um, overall, man, for me, service was a solid nine. The food, another solid nine, mid-range. Uh, the atmosphere, minus our slanted table, which I didn't mind. We picked it out. Like, there were different options. I wanted to sit in the sun. Um, man, that, that's a tough one. It's probably an eight there. And then overall value for me goes back to an eight. So... Uh, you know, flipping the coin, is it an eight and a nine? If we're not doing halves, ultimately it, it rounds up to a nine for me because the experience was that good. It was a fun experience going there with Noah for a lunch. It's a great place to go with a friend. All right. So yeah, Marco's, uh, cool fire pizza. Uh, I actually really dug the place. I thought it was really nice. Um, I, I did like the uh, back patio that we sat in. There was some uh, is some great views out there. I mean, uh, there's like a little bit of a kind of like a park you could see. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see the mountains from from right there. Or at least I I couldn't from my perspective uh, or point of view. And then 
Um, I would have also would have probably liked to maybe to go there one more time to sit inside to see what it's like on the inside. But the overall atmosphere I thought was a pretty enjoyable atmosphere. Um, although if I wasn't looking for the place, I definitely would have missed it. So I think you can, like, I don't know, maybe you have to like kind of dip into this like parking lot neighborhood little like area thing that they have going on right there or uh you know if someone has to kind of tell you about it because I, I don't know how you found it but like i <laughs> definitely would have never like would have thought there was a pizza place right there but i'm glad we went and uh, i thought the value for lunch time was great uh <laughs> that's because i got the lunch special the lunch special uh, was eleven dollars. Came with a great salad that has nice balsamic vinaigrette on there, uh, fresh mozzarella, little cherry tomatoes. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, they they don't use iceberg lettuce, so they use like good quality like uh, lettuce. Uh, <laughs> and then the pizza itself, it's just uh, cheese pizza, but then for an extra two dollars and fifty cents, you can add toppings. So I added uh, artichoke carts and Kalamata olives, and those were like that. Just like I was looking for something more of a like a Mediterranean type of like flavor for a pizza, and that nailed it right there. That that nailed it out of the park. It was great. It was light. It was refreshing. It was filling, and I gotta give them. I gotta tip my hat off to their tiramisu that they had because the tiramisu was great. They looked like they used like real lady fingers. Um, and mascarpone cheese. So I was like, yeah, I was like, it was worth the uh, extra, I think 12 or f whatever dollars it was. Yeah. I think it almost cost it more than my pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know what? I think you're right. Cause yeah, it was like nine or $12 for that. <laughs> for Masu. But you did give me one bite and that bite was phenomenal. Yeah, it was great. And so, uh, the, their term was, he was uh, it reminded me why that what that used to be my top number one type of dessert. Um, right now, it's still like if I can find a good lemon cello cake, I still think that beats out the tiramisu. But that uh, when you get good tiramisu, it's hard to beat. That's for sure. Kind of helps any great dessert. Kind of helps make a restaurant a destination. It does, and so um, the other pizzas though for the size and. You know, like the, I got, I got to try a piece of yours, uh, your pizza, and it was good, uh, but I'm not sure if it was like twenty five dollars good, but it was definitely really good. And I think what really drives up the price was they were using authentic uh, ingredients from Sicily and stuff like that. So that does help drive up costs, uh, food costs and stuff. Um, so food value. I'm going to give it an eight uh, because I do think because of the fresh ingredients that you get, it kind of drives up that food cost. But then you also pay what you get to, you know, you pay for what you get. Um, although I feel like I got a slamming deal. Dude, you got an absolute crazy deal. He also shared a piece of his with me and not that I regretted it, but looking at the fact that you got a salad, and a drink and it was half the price of my pizza i was like did my pizza give me everything i wanted at the end of the day it had a few things that i was looking for that yours did not but i like if i went back i would absolutely get the deal you did unbeatable yeah i thought my deal was great so uh the weight service i thought was decent um I, no complaints there i give her about an eight though um, the food I give an eight. The atmosphere, um, I I say for right now an eight. You know, and, and, and food value probably about an eight. So I'm gonna go eight across the board. Uh, is it a destination place? Uh, well, as I was telling Jesse, he should call it a destination place after recommending it to like 50 people. <laughs> uh, now, what I call it a destination spot, and I, I believe, as I told Jesse, like if I'm if I want pizza, especially at lunchtime, uh, from where we're located to where uh, other places that are around, it is 100% a destination. Now, if I live like let's say 
45 minutes away like in uh in westminster or closer to an hour like in boulder would i drive from there all the way out to this place definitely not it's not that kind of destination spot for me uh but in the area that i live in yeah that's uh i'm gonna go there to get pizza um and honestly like even if you're talking about like uh Papa Murphy's ten dollar like uh, large pizza deal day on Tuesdays. Um, if it's at lunchtime, I'm going. I'm going <laughs> to Marco's because I'm gonna get a nice salad, uh, pizza. You know, so, slightly bit smaller than what you would get over at uh, Papa Murphy's, and a drink. You know, for eleven bucks. Uh, so yeah, I, I think hands down, I'm gonna. You know, I think it's a destination if it's within a certain radius. Because uh, I don't think there's any other pizza joints that uh, can compete. Uh, so there, there's that. Um, I guess on to Smarter Challenge. Smarter Challenge. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> when I take a date there, hell yes. When I meet friends there, hell yes. Uh, so I, is there anything else? Am I missing no, one? No, that's it. Are those the two metrics? Date, uh, Dude, yeah. Date friends. Like at the end of the day, I agree with you. It, it's it's crazy that there's even a question of would this be a destination where you can be like, would I take a date or a friend there? Yes, yes. <laughs> like, would I meet a friend there? Yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> Seriously. Why do you want to say tomorrow? <laughs> <We could. laughs> I'm getting the fee, the fit and lunch deal. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you get the feels for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this week's Smarter Challenge, Fast X, or Fast and the Furious 10. If uh, anyone hasn't figured this out by watching any of our other episodes, spoiler alerts all the way around. We will ruin this shit out of a movie for you if you haven't seen it yet and you don't want us to ruin it. So with that, spoiler alert, Fast X, um, the 10th or 11th film in the Fast and the Furious franchise, if you in include Hobbs and Shaw. I think you're going to have to include Hobbs and Shaw now because... Because, like, really, uh, Hobbs and Shaw were both in this movie for a, a fraction of a moment. So, you know, they're probably going to have big roles in the next movie. And I feel like those roles clashed because of the fact that they both were in very small roles and then both departed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with it, um, any like first off, any real takeaways when you think about how this followed up with the previous 10 films in the Fast and the Furious franchise? Well, going into the scene, this movie, I was like really a whole another freaking Fast and Furious <laughs> movie. Like I'd rather see another Hobbs and Shaw movie because I really like the tandem between uh, Dwayne Johnson and uh, Jason, Jason Statham. Statham. Yeah. yeah. I thought they uh, made a pretty good duo. Um, so I, I would rather see another one of those than another like <laughs> full on like Fast and Furious movie. But I will say uh, the way they did this um there are some parts I really enjoyed. There are some funny parts. And then there's parts I was like, yeah, that's a little bit too ridiculous, <laughs> yeah. like driving down a, a dam, uh, which I'm not spoiling anything there because that's actually in the in the previews, in one of the previews. I mean, we already gave them the alert. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think overall the way I felt walking out of the movie was like I enjoyed it. But it left me. It was weighed, measured, and it was, it was found wanting. Still, I feel like there's still something I, that was missing from it. And and I guess you know because it is going to be a two-parter. Uh, maybe what I'm seeking to get out of it, it will be in the next movie. Is what I'm thinking. For me, overall, same general synopsis, and that is just it at the end. I wanted a little bit more closure on any front. I didn't want three new doors opened. I wanted one door shut, and I did not get that. Instead, all these different doors are open. What's going to happen with Dom and his son? What's going to happen with Giselle and Cypher? What's going to happen with The Rock, you know, <laughs> uh, with all these different pieces? And Letty. Don't forget Letty, right? Letty and, and uh, Cypher. Well, yeah. like, and, and that's just it. Like, where does all of this go? Jason Statham and his mom, um, these different roles 
it, it's it's wild. It literally opened up more doors than it closed. What I will say though is was it entertaining? For me, 100%. It was entertaining. I was, I was laughing my ass off, but I also left the theater wanting more. And it's great to want more, but when there's a hollow feeling with wanting more, that's when it's not so great. And it did leave me just a little bit of that hollow feeling, like give me some some one piece of closure. Like that's, one piece I, of closure. I think that's a good way of putting it because it was like a hollow wanting. It was like it didn't really fix the need it just like it left like a real hollow feeling in it like and here's the thing like he brings in like uh jason statham's character uh shaw shaw and uh and his mom and they they pose the problem like his mom's in danger and he's like all right fine i'm gonna help you kick these guys' ass here real quick i'm gonna grab all my shit and i'm gonna go deal with you know go protect my mom basically type of thing but that's all you that i mean that you you can only assume that because he doesn't really say that and he just like disappears and then like the crew all of a sudden like that's you know with shaw they next thing you know they're like on an airplane like okay well did shaw give you guys that airplane like how you guys get that airplane like uh and all those tools like i'm assuming like shaw hooked you guys up but nothing really tells me he did right i, I agree with you i loved that scene because you've got decker shaw and he's going after to save his, his mom queenie and you've got all of the uh, well not all of them several other people that uh, are with him and then all of a sudden he finds out his mom might be in danger which it's great that was a great play showing that hey we know you care about your mom we just saw this and where's, the, where's the sister how come the sister wasn't involved oh man well there can only be so many attractive women in one movie <laughs> I think she's the best looking out of all of them. Oh, for sure. But with that, I agree with you. But what was hilarious, what my favorite part of that scene was, is then he proceeds, once he finds out his mom's in danger, he grabs a giant duffel bag and starts putting 200 pounds worth of guns and grenades and smoke bombs and weapons in this thing. Like, nobody's carrying that out like he did. He's just like, I'm out of here throwing this in my Super GT race McLaren. <laughs> like, literally stepping into a million dollar McLaren, by the way. Not the ones he's been driving in the previous movies. This is the next level. Uh, and I love that. But yeah, I agree. Like, okay, so now what the fuck? Well, talking about that scene, <laughs> excuse me, the best part of that whole scene, though, was like when they, that is, uh, when they walk up to, uh, Decker Shaw's place and he's sitting there punching his bag. <laughs> and then it finds out, like, the, then we find out, like, it was actually a person inside that bag who's wearing, like, it's like a, like a chubby guy <laughs> who's like only wearing tidy whities and when he's like released from the bag it just runs out and everyone's like what the fuck did we just see <laughs> except that they were all too cool about it except for tyrese gibson or roman pierce who's like what was that anyone else see that <laughs> <laughs> it was a great scene it was kind of like a uh, you know a, a stolen scene from uh die another day but it was great i really did enjoy it, it was hilarious now it was now that rolls into the next question what were your two or three favorite scenes of the whole movie okay well before i jump into my two or three <laughs> favorite scenes i mean that's obviously one of my favorite scenes right there okay uh because it was just straight up hilarious um I, I think some of the other things that were kind of left wanting in that, in that, uh, in this movie, one would be, you know, where's Hobbs, right? And I mean, everyone knows that there is like some, uh, some conflict between, uh, Dwayne Johnson and Vin Diesel. Uh, but, uh, but they, spoiler alert, they did work it out. So Hobbs is actually in a, in a small, tiny part in this movie. Uh, but you kind of wish like he'd be around more. And then what happened to little nobody, little nobody, like he didn't die. We know he didn't die, but he's like injured, but, but he's like out of commission. But, like what happened to him? Is he all right? Or is he not all right? Like where's little nobody at? I agree with that. And I also love the, the fact that little nobody is Scott Eastwood, Clint Eastwood's <laughs> son. <laughs> <laughs> and then Brie Larson's character. I mean, Brie Larson, like, ooh, she was looking, she was definitely, uh, 
uh, some eye cookie in there, you know. So <laughs> she did. She definitely looked nice. We're not talking chocolate chip, just sugar. <laughs> uh, but like her character, it just like she like just disappeared. Like she was there all, all up to the part where she helped Letty uh, get to the uh, uh, to the medical area of, of the of the prison that she's in. But then after that, she like kind of like disappears and then randomly shows up at a shootout and then kind of like disappears <laughs> right she has to go to a hospital or something like I mean, that you know like her i don't know i i think i would have preferred mr nobody than captain than, marvel <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I might almost prefer uh mr nobody but she's much better to look at than mr nobody <laughs> <laughs> and then talking about like nice people to look at, yeah, Sharice Theron. <laughs> For her age, she was looking pretty like pretty good. Now here's the thing. How much of that is actually like movie magic and how much of that is like really her? I don't know, but she was looking pretty good in that movie. You know, I think for me, the best part of both of those characters, though, what really made them attractive was just their character. The characters yeah. were superbly written. Um, yeah, trying to make it like less. Uh... <laughs> um, no, for me, I, for me, that's that's real. That's genuine. It's great. Like who I actually thought was unattractive because of her character was Letty. Oh, yeah, I think Letty. When Letty lost her crap on Cypher and almost ruined her way out of the black holding site, I'm like, you idiot. Like, what happened to, like, thinking about tomorrow? <laughs> right? Uh, that's what made Cypher so great. She's, like, sitting there hanging out after, like, their fight. Like, oh, yeah, it's pretty cold out there. Huh? You want some? You want yeah, to work now? Cult. You really want to work with me now? Or do you want to sit there and just keep fucking around? <laughs> Well, that's just it. She's like not going to eat glass, so to speak, but she, she does. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I mean, at this point, Letty has to eat crow because, like, she's like, "Oh yeah, I guess you're my only way out." Which, I mean, honestly, uh, wait until you're out to do that stupid stuff. Nobody's daughter. I forget what her name was. Uh, what's Brie Larson's character's name? I know you have them all right now. Oh, Tess. Tess. When Tess like says, "Do you trust me?" and puts her in there, she should have been like when she woke up and saw Cyber. She, you know, I could see her reaction. Being, oh fuck, not you! But like, I mean, all right, well, I trust Tess. Tess put me in this situation for a reason. So, but nope. It no, just like, uh, but that it was right. crazy lady being crazy lady time. Up until that point in the movie, I was like, okay, so you know, she she looks all right. Letty's Letty's cute, and then after that scene, the rest of the movie, I'm like, you're just an ugly person. <laughs> and I and I don't I I think it was all just based on man. If that's how you're gonna live your life, you will never get like you're not well, you have gotten this far. Maybe she's a little bit justified by like what she did at Dom's. Uh, I'm not saying any of it wasn't justified. Baby mama. But that's your way out. You yeah. know that might be your one way out. This lady just escaped, overrode a system, and got you freed from your chains. And your first thought is, oh, yeah. I'm going to kick your ass as opposed to, well, if you're going to get me out of here, I want to let you get me out of here. And then I'm going to kick your ass. That's what she should have done. <laughs> All right. But if you live that way, you like she would have never gotten this far in life. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. There's that. Uh, that was kind of left open. Um, what was another kind of thing I didn't like that was left? Oh, how everyone like, is it really kind of setting up to like where the whole like Fast and Furious crew is dead except for like Hobbs and Shaw and like the two women like Cypher, uh, Cypress and, uh, and Letty and Giselle who shows up randomly in a submarine boat uh, in the yeah. middle of the Antarctica. The nuclear sub, the one yeah. that stole, which they premised at the beginning. I thought that was pretty yeah. good. But when they said that, I'm like, wait a minute. What do they mean they stole a nuclear sub? <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. Honestly, when you think about it, it's Fast and Furious. Do you really think Dom's kid's dead? No. Do you really think the whole crew's dead on an airplane? No. Uh, the only one who I think might be really dead it might be John Cena's character, who I thought did a great job playing his character uh, as as the as uncle, uh, whatever uncle. I forget it was uncle somebody or other. Um, Jacob Toretto, yeah. uncle, Jake. Okay, uncle uncle Jake. I thought he, like he did a pretty good job kicking you some ass. Me. But then, and the funny thing is, like I know you and I have talked about it. Like he's not one of my favorite character, uh, like favorite actors. But recently, there's been some like some great stuff that he's been in, like Peacemaker and Wedding cr Wedding Friends. Wedding Friends, <laughs> like those two movies. Like he, like that's his, like that's his, uh, that that that's his, like 
thing. You it's know? like the mar- modern Schwarzenegger. He did what Schwarzenegger couldn't quite do in Twins. Right. <laughs> and then I and he does it here too. Like once he's like once he gets on beating the crap out of everybody and he's kind of joking around with his like uh with his nephew and stuff. That part was like great how he just jokes around and like it's kind of like him and, and he's driving that like crappy old Mustang 5.0. <laughs> I was laughing so hard in the theater. <laughs> it's like, what is so funny? And I'm like, wait, you guys got to understand that car was great. And then he's like, you got to understand if you drove one of these in the 80s, you were the shit. And the kid's like, you were the shit. And he's like, you can't say that word. He's like, what? It's only two uses of that word. <laughs> and then he puts in like, was it Rob Bass or something in there? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he's like only two ways you can use that word one or two uses for that word one in in music you can use that word in music and two if you stub your toe and then later on <laughs> when they get in his mechanic car kid's car, like holy shit and he's like i'm so sorry uncle jake he's like no it's cool <laughs> <laughs> you can say it in a cannon car too <laughs> I was loving it. I, I really didn't think the movie was great. It, it really just came down to the ending. But I think that's one of those open ones. Too. I'm not really sure if he's dead either. Oh, I would tend to think. Not. I would tend to think that he is dead with the, how that crash happened. But you know, with some of these movies, they're always like, "Oh, this is how he escaped," type of thing. You Giselle know, Giselle was dead. Han was dead. Yeah, all these Spine. people are dead now. They're all alive, alive again. The guy had a plane in a canoe bag. Like I'm pretty sure he figured out how to survive that. Right. <laughs> and the, this also brings a question: Like, what up to the guys from Tokyo Drift? Where are those two dudes at? I, I, I don't know, but it was great. Like I really did enjoy them reintroducing all of the different characters. That was fun. That was fun. All right, now for my. One of my favorite scenes, actually, this actually might be my favorite scene. I might have to take back the uh, the white guy running. <laughs> the tiny white. My favorite scene, my, I think one of my favorite scenes has to be Jason Momoa uh, painting uh, fingernails and toenails yes. on these two dead guys, and the way he just like talks to them and stuff like that. Like he's uh, like a complete psychopath, uh, and it's just, uh, or as you put it, I, I guess sociopath, but. It is just, it was just funny. And he's like, "All right, well, stay here five minutes. Don't move." And they're like, "Dad, you got flies flying all around them." He like, lands on his head. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, "Someone will be back here to bury you guys. <laughs> yeah, give you a dirt nap." <laughs> um, that scene was absolutely, definitely to me. Um, two pieces to that. Number one funniest scene in the movie like standalone because it came out of nowhere like you had all this action and all of a sudden he's like painting his nail and jason momoa this great big guy painting this dead man's nail whose eyes have been taped up uh, literally with scotch tape yeah like the face is all taped and then when his head starts falling he's like no 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 and he gently (laughs) pushes his head back and he's like okay all right there you go don't move that for five minutes (laughs) Like you'll mess up the paint, and he's talking to them though, like it's real. And that's when, again, Mila was dying of laughter. It was great to hear a kid understand how funny this was. And later on, it's she twisted too. It, it is twi- no, and that's just what's really great is it's so twisted. It should not be funny. Um, but what I will say is, Mila had a lot of questions afterwards about like what is going on with this and that and the other and what about all these different tendencies and i really emphasized her well that's a piece of being a sociopath or what some most sociopaths are known for is they they really have a struggle conforming to social norms or understanding what is acceptable and what's not acceptable and it's interesting because now we're all throwing that to the way um but but really doing that piece and that is when i have to say He's done some interesting work. Jason Momoa is not necessarily before this movie what I would consider like a great actor. Um, but this kind of brought him up right up there, just like an American psycho, where you have someone playing a sociopath. And I was like, this was actually so well acted 
It is unbelievable. It is absolutely award worthy the way he does every scene and he does it consistently through the movie. He plays his character so well. He's, he's not playing Aquaman here. He's not playing some militant. He is absolutely coming in and playing a sociopath who is beyond metrosexual. <laughs> <laughs> it was really hard at first to kind of get used to him. Like at first, I, it kind of put me off. But I mean, as you get to see his character more and more throughout the movies and get like learn about his character more, he does a really phenomenal job. He really does. Right, dude. And if we do like an awards, maybe we need to start doing awards once a year for movies on Scotch Hour and like MTV does. Dude, right now he's winning best costume of the year. I loved his snakeskin jacket. I loved his alligator jacket. Man, <laughs> the guy can dress. <laughs> <laughs> so what's another one of your favorite scenes all right so the most impactful scene to me um and you've already we've already talked about two of probably the three of my favorite uh, but this one by far was the most impactful and this is a scene where dom um uh, has was just trying to save his crew so to, pe so to speak by leading by roman pierce or tyrell and they find out that letty has been captured and queenie comes up as he's looking over a bridge down um, upon Rome and the Vatican and a bomb that just went off by the way and she's talking with him about it and he's like man my life I would give my life for any of these people and she puts her hand upon his cheek and she these aren't the exact words but she basically lets him know that is why I never dated men with children is because they know there may not be a tomorrow. In other words, they are not, once you have kids, you are no longer just living for today as a man. And it, it is true. I can say it myself. Uh, man, I was far more easygoing, free-spirited before kids. And it, it's real, you, you change. But it was so well portrayed in there that any father that doesn't catch it probably wasn't paying attention to the movie or ha has uh, very limited empathy uh, because I felt it. And man, right to my core, I was like, yeah, like if I was a woman and I was smart, that would absolutely be, you'd learn that real quick. Men with kids are looking a bit at the future. You are never going to get them to live 100% in the moment, which is tragic in some senses. Um, but at the other, uh, on the other side, it's like, if they were your kids, you would want that. It's just that they're not your kids. Yeah, I wouldn't know that because I don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was such an impactful scene and then later on followed up with a, a great comical scene as Jason Statham, um, you know, Deckard Shaw is getting everything ready. Like, in no hold bars. Like, he was, he's like, this is where it's at. And he takes a, a, a second, mentally prepares, and then grabs all the tools to go save his mom. Yeah, that part I did get. <laughs> yeah. but it, that's literally the other side of being a parent slash kid um because that's the the son side of taking care of your mother the other side is a, is the father side of taking care of your kids um but it was so interesting that queenie uh helen mirren gets to play this role that has such a big impact and i thought that was great i really do that this uh lady that you want that I, I would consider old and frail and you know for a movie of this nature she should have been pretty insignificant she's been very significant yeah her character while i think mean, her character really kind of flourished mostly in like hobbs and shaw it's also this weird flirtatious uh relationship with her and dom yeah like i think what did they match up like in nine was it nine or eight? Um, I think it started in eight, but it definitely bloomed in nine. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, it was definitely nine because she drove her. She drove Dom to see Jake. Yes. Uh, in nine. Yes. Yeah, when they're in Europe. Okay. Uh, anything else that we want to say about this? No, for me, great fun. I. I do. It's a, it's a recommend to me still. There were. It's not a bad movie in any sense. 
And if they can come out with Fast and the Furious 11, 12, and 13 fast enough, they won't lose it. But the problem is, is when people were left wanting this much and then they don't get some closure relatively rapidly, it doesn't just heal a wound, so to speak. It, it amputates an arm. So all of a sudden there is this potential of loss. Um, so I, I really do hope, because I haven't seen anything that they've got the next uh, installment in this franchise coming out quickly. Yeah, so I think this is definitely still a must-see, uh, even though at first I'm like, yeah, I, like, I might as well see because I've seen all the others, and Jesse made it a, a chore for me to go see now. <laughs> uh, but I'm really glad that you did. It was actually a fun, entertaining movie. Uh, there's definitely some parts where Jason Momoa made me laugh. There's parts where John Cena made me laugh. There, and 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 also the whole like joke about getting receipts for, for everything. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> uh, so there, there's definitely some great funny parts in there. Great action too. If you just want some like mindless action, there's some good mindless action in there. Um, yeah. So I say that I highly recommend that as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think uh, both. Both of us here say uh, go see it. Two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Makes it four thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> and a bottle. And a bottle. <laughs> well, let me get that bottle. <laughs> Sit stern. Sit stern. <laughs> All right. Uh, next week, uh, we have what? As our scotch. All right. Next week's scotch is the Penderin Legend. Uh, this is... A 43% ABV, non-chill filtered, no color added, single malt scotch. All right. So the topic for next week, I was tossing around a couple of ideas. I thought because it said legend on there, that we should do some kind of legend like uh, uh, like King Ar Arthur. Ar 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 Arthur? Arthur? having troubles today uh but i went against that i'm gonna go with uh doing a review and this has probably been done well enough but we haven't done it and talked about it of squid game okay on netflix how many seasons are there one okay one season i think eight episodes maybe i can do that eight hours yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be a couple long nights we tired at work <laughs> worth it and, and i think because in there i think uh i think we can answer a question about a legend or leaving a legacy if you will to create a legend here uh because there's actually i think some undertones in there that we can even talk about with like some things about deep state-ish type of uh raw child parties type stuff so uh, so that will be the topic, and that is the scotch for next week. Uh, thank you for all you who made it this far. We greatly appreciate it. To all of our viewers out there on YouTube and Rumble, we greatly appreciate you. To all of our listeners on any of the podcast platforms that we are on, we also greatly appreciate you as well. Uh, hopefully you all have a wonderful evening. I'll pass it on to Jesse to close this out. All right. Remember, drink responsibly. Do not drink and drive. Life is great. Continue to give us feedback, 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 feedback. Data, data, data. Without mortar, I cannot build a wall. <laughs> All right. And with that, until next week. Life is great. Life is great. Scotchman. Cheers. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed this evening's episode of Scotch Hour. If you did, please like share and subscribe also if you have not done so already please become a patron member with memberships starting as low as one dollar a month thank you and hopefully you have a wonderful evening